Ending the dysfunction in your life or moving on from dysfunction in your life can be challenging. For those of us who are lucky enough to see that chapter end or those chapters come to an end, sometimes life can still bring up those emotions and feelings at a moment's notice. When you talk about this idea of staying, why do you want to stay? Is it an idea of love or is it an idea of expectation? Or is it an idea I think it's an listening? idea of whenever you're in the situation or this, there's the person who you're with, like who you do love and who is a good person. And, you know, the reason why you're in the relationship to begin with. And then there's the person who did these really bad things to you. Right. So I think the idea of staying is because to leave means you have to leave them both. Right. But when you're, if you stay, you might get to keep the good one. Right. And I think that's what's hard. Right. Is giving up both of them. Were there points when you guys both felt this is enough, we need to leave, but you stayed together? Most of the time, yeah. Most of the time. Mm -hmm. So what would keep you guys together after you knew you needed to leave? I don't know, love, sex, stuff like that, you know, just generally, yeah. We were young and stupid, too. Is there a time where you felt like this is enough and you actually walked away from the relationship? Yes. What, what was the difference in that moment versus any of the other moments? Because of my newfound understanding, there's literally no reason ever for violence. Man or woman, just walk away. And I tell people there's a right, wrong, your truth, my truth. But the truth is there's only one answer to that question, walk away. How do you have the willpower to stop yourself in that moment? Because you know what you're doing is wrong. If you see the totality of domestic violence, we cannot treat everyone as, as they are going to be murderers. We have seen many times these women coming and saying, I, what I want is the violence to stop. I don't want him to leave. <laughs> you know, I want the violence to stop. So how do you do that? Uh, in terms of reasons of why women stay, I mean, they're very, very diverse. Sometimes there are emotional reasons. I mean, some of these women love the men, you know. This, men who, who use violence are not monsters all the time, <laughs> you know. They, they sometimes are very seductive, very... And sometimes they're good with their children and so on. So there's different aspects of them that women still might say, well, you know, I like that part of him. I don't like this other part of him. You know? So if we really want to listen to the victims, to women, uh, we really have to hear, well, what is it that you really want? We know in relationships, sometimes you get uncomfortable and jealousy is a completely natural emotion, but it really has a lot to do with what you do with that jealousy. So if you can sit down and communicate and be like, this makes me feel uncomfortable, reevaluate your relationships is something you really want to work towards um, without saying, it makes you feel uncomfortable, you need to stop talking to them. Like, that's not healthy. That's starting to set rules. Because jealousy really has more to do with how we feel about ourselves mm. than what that person's doing. Mm. Now, if you feel that you're in a violent relationship, communicating might not be the best, it won't be the best option for you possibly because it could escalate the violence. Mm. If you're scared, if you're worried, that's not a healthy relationship. Something's telling you, hey, pay attention to this. Think about it. If this continues and it, be, it is a pattern and it gets worse, it can be dangerous. Um, we know that domestic violence, dating violence with teens or adults can lead to someone being murdered. When I first called the police, the, one of the first things they asked was, did he live here? Mm. And I didn't know, but it was, he couldn't be arrested in the house. So they didn't even come inside. He had to, he tried to leave before they could even arrest him. And then even the police, when they did arrest him, they came in and they were like, is this something y'all could work out? Like, do you really want to get us involved, you know? deal with rent issues and they even brought up you know are you going to be able to afford the rent if he's gone like they brought up this kind of stuff this, and this is what the cops are at the saying cops. to you mm -hmm. okay and at that point did they see that you had been hit mm -hmm. by him and they're still asking these kinds of questions mm -hmm. they first asked me had this happened before okay um did it hurt um was this something i could get over if we leave him here Will it happen again? Um, 
And if are we sure we wanted, was I sure I wanted them to arrest him? These are all questions they These asked are all you before questions they would arrest him. Mm-hmm. How did it make you feel when they're asking you questions? <laughs> like I was crazy. Like, why did I call them? Like, <laughs> there is no right way to handle that situation. There is no, um, there's no correct steps. So when people tell you, oh, I w- you should have done this, or why didn't you do this? There is no right way to handle when that happens to you. It doesn't matter if you're prepared. It doesn't matter, you know, if, if you are a fighter, if you're, it doesn't matter. When you're in that situation and you're scared, there is no right way. So you can stop beating yourself up because you didn't handle it right. And I didn't have that family relationship where you could tell them what's happening, you know? Um, you can't be telling them like, oh, my boyfriend, you know, calls me mean names and everything. And when I started distancing myself from him a couple of months, like, you know, into the new year, he started to become a lot more like violent towards me, you know? Th- throughout that time, it was also spreading around the school, like what had happened, you know? And not only was it spreading, but like the wrong information was spreading. So I had um, people attacking me from different, you know, angles. So definitely my friends being there for me and having something to do in my spare time than to sit at home and think about it was definitely what saved me, I think. The night that he physically cut my dress off of me as I was laying on the couch, Mm. and I ended up finally after probably an hour of trying to get the keys from him to get out of the house, to get into the vehicle, And I sat in that vehicle and I thought, this is crazy. I mean, it was just that moment that it was like, he's gonna kill me. Mm -hmm. I do not wanna see my kids see this. I don't want my kids intervening in between us. Mm -hmm. So we left and moved in with my dad and it got worse. Mm. It got worse. And it was hard for um, a year and a half before we were actually divorced and he, has everything, the house, the land. Mm. And he has kept uh, telling the kids, if mom comes home, everything will be fine. Your, her life will be so easy. She doesn't have to work. I will take care of you. I will buy your vehicles. I will put you through school. But if she doesn't, then I have no relationship with any of you either. made us leave was since my dad was in a a legal business some of his friends that were mad at him at the time um robbed us and beat our dad and stuff like that and tied us onto the ground Mm -hmm. so it like it made like um like it made her realize that like we can't be here like this isn't safe for me or the kids Mm -hmm. so she so like a few weeks after she took us and we just left Mm -hmm. Basically near the end of their relationship, we had packed the stuff and we're sitting at the end of our driveway in the middle of the night. And we started coming to the safe place, but it was a secret thing. Mm -hmm. We didn't tell my dad where I was. Uh, And we didn't tell my dad what we were doing. mm -hmm. You know, there was just, we would come to a group once or twice a week Mm -hmm. and he just didn't know. Okay. And then he started to find out. One time we were on our way here to group and he called because he had found out that that's where we were we were coming here. Mm-hmm. And he said that if my mom was to ever come home, there would be a bloodbath. Oh, wow. Wow. So we went home because we had to get stuff. And he choked my mom and almost killed her while I was in the shower. The Hayes County Sheriff's Department came out and basically told my mom that our house was too clean for there to be domestic violence happening. That's what the police said? Pretty much. Okay. They didn't believe that that's what happened. She's like, but the bruises, the choke marks, and they just kind of brushed it off as if, you know, middle-class white family's house, there's nothing going on. It's clean. It's nice. Yeah. There's nothing going on, which really set off a lot of stuff for my mom. The sheriffs didn't believe her. Wow. But I really loved my dad, and I was really, really upset when I had to be like, hey, You know, but I knew it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any second guesses about telling my dad I never wanted to see him again. Right. 
I knew that that's what had to happen for my well-being. Right. So your father never had to go to jail for his crimes? No. Um, were, like, the sexual assaults ever reported to the police? Mm -mm. The protective order was the only thing that ever really happened to him. Right. And it really didn't do much other than the fact that he couldn't come near us. Right. Come near my mom. Right. I mean, it took away all of his guns, but he eventually got them back. Okay. I mean, the sad truth about it is that nobody really believes anybody when they first say anything. Mm. Like, my mom went to the police, and they didn't believe it. You know, my dad's friends and coworkers, they're like, no, that could never happen. That's always the line. No, that doesn't happen. That could never happen. That couldn't happen to you. And it's like, but it did. Mm. And so you need to keep saying stuff about it. Don't back down from the situation. You need to get out there and you need to seek help and you need to talk about it and you need to make sure that people know what's going on so that you can get the help you need to get out of the situation. Mm. You know, and a lot of people say that they're sorry. And you're like, what do you have to be sorry for? Don't be sorry, help. You know, right? don't, you know, we don't, as survivors and even victims, they don't want pity. They want help. They want somebody to bring them up, to show them that they're, they're believed in. They know, you know, that listening to a survivor or victim is probably the best thing you could do for them. Mm. What do you think that boundary is that changes them from being someone who wants to beat somebody up to somebody who wants to kill someone. I believe when our work is done, we're going to figure out that men who strangle women have far more childhood trauma in their lives than men who slap or push or punch or verbally abuse women. I think we're going to find that it all goes back to childhood. And those men that end up strangling women, those are men with incredibly high trauma scores in their lives from childhood. And nobody cares about childhood trauma when he's killed a woman. He's an adult. He's got to answer for his crime. We take it seriously. He, we hold him accountable for those consequences. I get that and I believe in that. But we're missing the whole point if all we're doing is focusing on what's going on at the bottom of the cliff and we don't go back up to the top of the cliff and ask ourselves, why are they going off the cliff? What's happening before the woman dies? And the answer I think we're going to find is a ton of childhood trauma. Entonces, eso fue la razón. Pude irme, pero en realidad, cuando uno sufre violencia doméstica, nunca se va. Okay. O sea, porque, o sea, tu, tu cuerpo se puede ir del lugar o abandonar a la pareja, pero eso, yo, yo siento que, que nunca te vas, okay. ¿no? O sea, uh -huh. que, que tu cuerpo te puedes cambiar donde quiera que vayas, uh -huh. pero esa parte sigue ahí. One thing that, that binds Latino cultures in general is, is the emphasis on, on family and the importance of family and community. One, one thing that I love to talk about is that we often, when we talk about cycles, we only talk about the, the negative cycles, right? The cycle of violence, the cycle of fatherlessness, which is another one that is inherited, right? Yeah. But there's positive cycles. There's such thing as the cycle of love mm -hmm. that you pass from generation to generation, or the cycle of respect that you pass from generation to generation. So when you break a negative cycle and you start a positive one, you're not only doing it for your family, you're doing it for seven generations as a Native American, so yes. you know, for the future. One size does not fit all, basically, that, that different people have different needs. Uh, that shelter is only one aspect of the supports that women who have su suffered violence need. In, in fact, it's a very important, but a small aspect of it. Immigration laws have become more stringent in certain states, but also at the federal level. Mm. Uh, uh, Latina women are afraid to call the police, to access services, to go to court, and so on. I 
I was able to get out of the relationship. Um, it did. I felt like now, looking back, it took me longer than it should have, but I didn't know then. And I was dealing with a lot of people with blame, guilt, and the feeling of, I can change this. I, mm. I can get through it. I'm a strong person. I'm smart. Mm. I can make this better. I can change him. Mm. But when I did realize it, if I think back and I really, really try to think, what was that moment? Um, I just, something inside of me said, you don't have to deal with this. Mm. And no one was telling me that. Mm. Everyone was questioning and everyone was a little confused. And I don't blame anyone because we didn't know. Mm. Um, I started building friendships outside of that relationship. So I started breaking down that isolation that had happened. I started finding things that were of my personal interest and not involving him. So as soon as I started building my independence, um, I was able to get out. And in your marriage, it took a while before you, you know, even called the police. Uh, what were some of the reasons? Well, for me, there were, I won't say that the police were roadblocks, but I can say that they didn't help when, when I feel like they, they should have. For instance, when, when they took me to the shelter, they told me that they couldn't arrest my husband, even though I was black and blue and so, so bruised and battered that the, the person who called the police just looked at me and said, do you need me to call the police? The pictures that I saw of myself, I know I looked like I had been beat up, but they didn't arrest him. They said it was because I had waited for four hours before I called the police. Now, obviously, that was just a damn excuse because I've been told since then that there's never been anything on the books that says that, you know, you have to report before four hours. So they just didn't want to do the paperwork. And so they didn't arrest him. I wish there were more places and more help because everybody's not going to be qualified. You, you're not going to always be in an imminent danger. So you're not going to be qualified to get into a shelter if you're not in imminent danger. So there needs to be a stopgap in between the imminent danger and before you get there, you know. But if there were resources, some, some other resources be, before and other than the shelter, then I think more people would leave their abusive situations right. earlier. A lot of folks who come to us for services have limited incomes. And that's not because domestic violence or sexual assault affect low-income people more. It's because people with access to more resources don't come to us. So if I'm a survivor of domestic violence, if I have the means not to go to a shelter, I'm probably going to prefer to get a hotel room or go to a friend's place or fly across the country to my sister's house rather than be in a shelter Community members and in communities of color, particularly, they've always said men are key to us changing any situation, especially violence against women, right? We can't leave them out of this discussion. We can't leave them out of this movement. So we need to figure this out together. Um, so programs like Amina Latino in Atlanta have a family program where they work with men, they work with the women, they work with the children, they work with the entire family unit. And that's one of the programs we highlight and we lift up. Um, because they're having an impact on, you know, not just the survivor, but the men, and then the children. You're impacting intergenerational transmission of violence if you take this approach. That's also something we're constantly working on is who is not at the table, who is not being represented. Um, undocumented individuals for years haven't been. We've worked quite a bit on trying to raise awareness around those issues. Um, but the LGBT community, we know that the rates of suicide, the rates of violence are significantly high in the trans community, right? And so figuring out how we can grow ourselves and our community to communities to respond to these pockets of community, other community members within our community um, is gonna is key. Sometimes the abusers have no idea that they're doing it. And I've referenced the Hulk before in, in, in the sense that, you know, Bruce Banner turns into the Hulk. He knows he turns into the Hulk. He doesn't want to turn into the Hulk. Um, but he's learned to control it to the point where he can benefit society. And I know that's such an out there reference, but there are so many people with inner demons and monsters and, you know, maybe they just figure that it's hopeless when it's not. I mean, in, on the same level where 
victims of domestic violence can get help, so can the abusers. And I, I wish that, I, you know, I, I always say forgive, but don't forget. Whew. Um, I have dark days now because uh, I'm still dealing with the court system uh, with my son. My, my daughter has been my strength. And I say she's been my strength because she's more 2015 instead of 1968, the old philosophies, the old understandings. She sees and views life today. Um, she understands that her father is hurt, you know, behind how situations were uh, with, with, with his, you know, children. But she strengthens me because she talks about now. And she tells me she needs me now. And she tells me I have to keep my anger not concealed but in control because people want to see you fail when they put you through a negative process. And she encourages me, encourages me not to fail. And then, uh, and it's real. Yeah. It's really crazy to think about rebuilding a relationship with your father, just because the, the Joe he knew back then is totally different from me now. We go out to eat once a week, which is nice. But it was really cool because he like apologized. Okay. He was like, you know, I'm really sorry. I wasn't the greatest dad ever, blah, 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 and story. And so we kind of worked that out a little bit, which is nice. I forgive him to an extent, mm -hmm. but there was some really messed up stuff that went on. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's just I had come out as a survivor, and I had been for probably a year and a half, two years. Mm -hmm. And so there's, like that part of me that I don't show him or mm. talk about. Mm. And that's a really big part of me, which really bothers me, is that I can't be like, oh, I'm a survivor of domestic violence and sexual assault and all that kind of stuff, mm. just because I don't want to have to talk through that and have that conversation with him. Right. Just because it was kind of a, I'm sorry, and it was kind of a forgive and forget kind of thing mm -hmm. on his part, mm -hmm. but it wasn't on my part. Right. I realized I was maybe trying to figure out why um, this person didn't care for me anymore. And I realized what I had done. And I knew that I'd, it was, I, I likened it to a scar. Okay, so I'd scarred this woman in a certain way. And scars heal. They leave scar tissue. And I realized that, that whatever I did to her can never be the same again. It's always gonna have scar tissue on it. Scars heal, but you can always see the wound. Right. You're always gonna be reminded of what you did right. or what somebody else did to you. Right. Is it hard to break that behavior? Do you find yourself wanting to act that way? Or was it just easy to stop the behavior once you- It's not, it's not easy. It's a learned behavior and once, just like anything else, once you travel down that road, I mean, do I feel angry? Not really. But have I seen times where I know for a fact I would have hit somebody like in my past life? Yeah, I've seen that situation. I don't do it today. No. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to. After five days of trial on economic issues and then months later, five days of trial on custody, the judge at that time ordered sole legal and sole physical custody to the mother. So from that day forward, I had zero say in any decisions about the health, welfare, or education of my children. I nearly vomited when the judge said that. My parents had to both hold me up to walk me out of the courtroom. Um, it's an understatement to say that was devastating. Right. And I've often prayed that she would get the help she needs. Because the traditional model doesn't allow for women who have issues with violence to get treatment to try to find ways to move towards healthy relationships. So it doesn't help women either. Um, 
I was really angry with how I dealt with things and just really confused. Um, and I kind of hated myself a lot uh, and blamed myself for some of the things that happened in my life. Um, and the camp just kind of gave me hope, honestly, and showed me that I wasn't alone in that and that there was a way to get past it and work through those things and that the, the things I went through didn't have to define the person I became in my life. The first year I came, it definitely I felt kind of more like a camper in the emotional sense. Uh, I was going through a lot that I had never dealt with and never faced. The following year, my brother came, and the year after that, my sister and my brother were there with me. And so that was kind of a big moment for me, too, to see them kind of go through what I went through the first year I came and kind of face the demons that they had from the same person that gave me my demons. So it was just good to have everyone there with me, I guess. If I'm able to see change in at least one kid a week. I mean, that's, that's really my goal. Just if I, by the start of the week, I hear a lot of negative things and a lot of negative like self views that these kids have. And if by the end of the week, at least one of them has a better, better view on their life and better view on their future, I feel like I've done what I can for them. Mm. Say last year, the way I was acting at school, it would really affect me mm. because since all I have seen in my life is violence, mm. so when, so when somebody talks something like, talks something mm. bad, I like just can't take it and I snap. But mm. also through Camp Hope, it has helped me learn some self-confidence and hope. And you has know. it helped you a bit with your patience a little bit? Actually, not a little bit, a lot. Like, no matter what, you may like be like, I'm not worth nothing, I'm not, I'm, I'm not. But. You should know that everybody's unique, no matter what. Everybody's different, and being different makes you what you are. I get a lot of memories about what has happened in the past, and um, makes me feel really down. Yeah. Yeah, and like, I have a good memory on dates, and like, I remember the dates that I came into foster care, and like, the last day I seen my mom and stuff like that, and like, every time that date comes by, I'm just like, it makes me really feel down. Right. I take counseling. Okay. I actually graduated from it, and then um, I had been going through a lot of depression, so then I started up counseling recently, not that long ago. Hmm. Do you feel like you get any benefits from going to counseling? Um, well, just like not having to keep all my feelings in and like being able to um, trust someone and like get someone to talk to about my trauma and stuff. In America, we raise our criminals at home, and the vast majority of people we put in jails and prisons for all crimes in America come out of homes with some mix of child abuse and domestic violence and or drugs and alcohol. The vast majority. And if we want to change that, we're not going to build more prisons. We're not going to build better prisons or bigger prisons. We're going to go back to childhood for all of them, and we're going to focus on giving them cheerleaders and pathways to hope. That's how we'll change the world. We're already spending the money now in America to deal with the impacts of both child abuse and domestic violence. In California, we spend over $50,000 a year to lock up one inmate in a California prison. $50,000 a year. You can look in any state in America and that number is anywhere between $20,000 and $60,000 a year. Wow. Camp Hope costs about $500 a week to send a child to camp once a year and then give them mentoring activities with somebody that loves them during the year. All in cost per child, probably a thousand bucks, maybe $1,500 a child per year if you really wanted to change the world. So when I hear people say we don't have the money, I get angry. I get really angry. We have the money. We're just spending it way late and we're spending far more at the bottom of the cliff and far less at the top of the cliff. And the top of the cliff is where you change the world.